Hello, my name is Jetty Choi. I went on a sum summer study abroad for about two weeks in India, and this is my presentation about the Western Ghats working with AERF through Project Dragonfly. Now, if you're asking what Project Dragonfly is, it's a online program through Miami University. It's not held at the Oxford site, so every time I have mentioned that I go to Miami University, everyone's like, oh, do you know this person? I go, no. No, no. I've been here at St. Louis the entire time while working on this degree, so I don't know any of the <laughs> wonderful uh, botany programs over there. So we have a master plan. It's basically like your thesis or your capstone project, which is at the end of the year, you just do a huge community project and get people involved more in about conservation. And some of our study abroad partners are not that. NGOs and other conservation organizations, which include the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in Australia, the Erebus Mongolian Center for the Palace Cats in Mongolia, the Galapagos Islands, works on the turtles, but I didn't get their organization name. India. So the state that I was in was Maharashtra. There are about 28 states and eight union territories. There are 22 official languages in India. Maharashtra has two official languages, which is Marathi and Hindi. And then Mumbai is the Bollywood capital. So when most people talk about Maharashtra, they're usually visiting Mumbai for all the fun, Bollywood dances and other things. But Pune is where people usually go to study. Monsoon season hits in, from June to October and the mountains of the Western Ghats receive about 2,500 millimeters of rainfall annually. This year when we had visited the Western Ghats, a lot of the local villagers had told us, the rains are really late this year. And we were there from June 17th to June 28th. The rain monsoon didn't start until like June 21st. Sacred groves. So the groves can range from a small fraction of one heca acre to 10 heca acres. And each grove is dedicated to one or more several gods. These gods are from the, either the local indigenous faith or the Hindu faith. And those would include the three main gods, Vishnu, Shiva, and, hmm. I'm so sorry, I forgot, oh, Brahm, Brahma. There are about a recorded amount of 13,720 groves put in the Western Gods. And then rather than using scientific method to help determine the value of the groves, they use ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are, are ways that they examine how mother nature is used into um, supporting their lifestyle. That's one way of putting it. There are 33 protected areas in the south, 11 protected areas in the north. Protected areas are parts of the sacred groves that are gov governmentally protected rather than other pockets of sacred groves that are just protected by the locals. Mm. One other thing to note about sacred groves are their land ownership is handled either by locals, private landowners, or the government. And then for most of the sacred groves that I visited for this trip, we dealt with a lot that were owned by the local villages. AERF, the Applied Environmental Research Foundation. So they were established in 1998. Their main headquarters is in Pune. They are led by Archana Goldbold and Jayant Saranak. The biggest goal for the this NGO is that they're community engagement conservation. They go out to the villages and see what is the best way to engage them into conserving the forest. And they have three branch sites and we mostly worked with the Devruk branch because about five of their sites, which are, oops, right around here are the ones that we visited. And then, oh, the top map is of the Samgeshwar block, which is where we were staying at for the entirety of the trip. So ARF works on closing the gap by having a nursery site that's in Pune, 
as you see in the bottom left right hand corner bottom right hand corner that's where my class and I are figuring out how to plant seedlings and then on the left bottom left is where they are holding the transfers of saplings into the groves and then the top top photo is them helping out with making a boundary line to, to prevent uh, livestock from eating all of the trees and saplings. Other ways that they help close the gap is by removing vines that grow very quickly due to the sunlight when they deforest all of the groves and then taking plant surveys of plots for people that are interested in how they do conservation or how uh, the carbon sequ sequestration of having the vines versus not having the vines affects the trees. So here we talk about meeting the villager needs. This is kind of similar to what we do out in Madagascar for Armand, where we talk to them and see what is the best way we can help support the village in, conservating, in conservation. You can't conserve if you can't provide them means of survival. So here we have cash crops, which include teak, cashew, acacia, and mangoes, and then production crops, which would include rice, millet, and lentils. And the photo with all of the colorful mat is where we're having a village meeting. And usually the village meetings are held with either one representative and the ARF representative, or it is a collection of the men of the village who will come together. Usually women and children are not included in these talks due to this being a patriarchy society. But one day that will slowly change. And then in the far right here, you can see the pickled, pickled mangoes and other like pickled vegetables and fruits that they like to sell that they will help produce and give to ARF and ARF will help sell them. And then some important grove plants. All of these are trees that I have listed. There are at least 500 plants, but these were the ones that were listed to us by our partners as important. So all of the ficus trees are, so all of these trees grow between 25 to about 40 meters tall. So all the ficus trees aren't gonna be cut down generally speaking due to religious reasons, but everything on the bottom is cut down when they're really tall due to getting a mass amount of timber and then getting money from that timber but the terminalia trees are very important due to the hornbills homes and those birds are endangered. And then here are some cultural plants and most of these are all used for medicinal usage or in other religious usage. Here you can see them breaking a coconut, which is what they use to start for a new, it's a blessings for a start of a new journey. So this is what happened on day one. They just broke open a coconut. And then this is a ficus religiosa tree. They are not just like in random spots in the forest. This one was in the marketplace in Dapoli. And it was a really random spot because like we had walked past it and then we saw this random alleyway and we went, oh, let's check this out. And then we found the little mini shrine and the shrines are actually for the tree and the string above it is for blessings of a long, prosperous marriage. And then we got to meet one man in Kardati who was very, very interested in bringing back traditional crops. So a lot of the traditional farming methods in India have mostly disappeared now. And a lot of the farm methods consist of just like all of your traditional, or not traditional, all of your usual production crops of just like white rice as you see here on the farms where they have the little rice paddies waiting for the rain to come so they can start spreading out the rice. Um, but white rice, uh, hmm. one moment. Anyways, this man discovered the existence of other grains while watching a TV program. And through the existence of their grains, he decided that he would want to farm and bring back the method of traditional farming. With traditional farming, it would be better for the environment because they're environmentally sustainable since they are native to this region. 
And it does help that there is demand for a various, uh, various rice and lentils. So AERF is now working with this man to see if they can produce a small crop, six by six plots, uh, with the youngsters that got returned home during COVID. And that is that. Thank you.